first of all, uh, that we are not to judge unbelievers and those who are outside of the faith. Um, and uh, Paul makes that perfectly clear, that people who are not Christians, people who are not believers, uh, who don't believe in the Lord Jesus, it's not our business and it's not our job to judge them. And uh, uh, I kind of think that a lot of people who are not Christians will probably think that we are judging them and think that we are probably quite judgmental people and it's really important that we don't and that we're building bridges and that we're uh, able to associate them and that, that we make it clear that we love them, that we're not judging them. We obviously do want them to come to a knowledge of, of Jesus Christ and we, uh, we want to love them and to work with them in various ways, but it's not our job to judge them. Um, secondly, we're not to take our, uh, if at all possible, we're not to take our arguments and our disputes, if we have them among us, to somebody who's not a believer, somebody who is outside of the faith. And that could apply in all sorts of different ways. In the church in Corinth, people were actually suing each other. People were sort of taking their disputes to legal people out in Corinth, to lawyers and what have you. And obviously, uh, Paul is telling people not to do that. But that can happen in much more trivial ways, can't, can't it? We can maybe go to a workplace and gossip about something that's happening in church. Or we could maybe share something on social media that kind of just brings to the surface an argument that we're having with another believer. And these things cause a certain amount of damage. And there's a phrase that people use for that, isn't that where families uh, are not supposed to share what's happening in the families. They say, don't wash your dirty linen in public. So we need to deal with these things among us, among the group of believers, so that we're not taking things to unbelievers. But the third thing is that we are to judge one another. And I've spoken on this before. It doesn't mean that I am the final judge of anybody's character, of whether anybody's a good or a bad person, but we are to judge each other in the sense that we are to deal with sin in the church and it can come from anywhere. It might be somebody who's a long-standing member in the church. It might be somebody who hasn't been in the faith for very long at all. Um, quite recently, um, just less than a week ago actually, I needed to confront somebody about something uh, and it wasn't something that I was looking forward to doing. And uh, I kind of asked somebody else who knew about the situation, would you please pray? Because I do need to, to speak to such and such about such and such. And it's not an easy thing to talk about. And this particular person was, is actually older than me. Uh, is one of the sort of dwindling members of the population of the world who are actually a little bit older than me. Uh, and so it, it's difficult and I needed to be very respectful and very careful the way I did that. And uh, so I went and I met with the person and I spoke, talked them through it. And I, uh, I said, look, I have this problem as well and I have to deal with it. And I tried to be as humble as I could about it. And we actually ended up having a really good conversation. And then a few days later, they sent me a text on the phone and they said, Jeremy, I just want to thank you for talking to me about that. And I was so relieved that it went well. Uh, and sometimes we do have to talk things through with people. So in that sense, we are to judge each other and we're to deal with sin in the church because Jesus is looking for a pure bride. Jesus wants his church to reflect his glory and his holiness and his righteousness. Um, and as we've already seen in the passage that we've read, we as Christians will actually judge the earth. And I'm not going to get into... Um, what people call eschatology and the, time, and the, uh, the last things. Um, but in some context or other in the future, if we're saints and if we believe in Christ, we will be involved in judging. And it even says in the passage that we just read that we'll judge angels. So we won't just judge other people, but we'll judge angels. So we need to kind of get into practice of doing this in a righteous way and in a right way and in the right way. And, and, and the place to practice is in the church, 
uh, in, in dealing with things in our own lives and in other people's lives. Um, <coughs> uh, sometimes we can see something in another person that the other person can't see, or sometimes another person can see something in us that we are just not even aware of. And the only way of dealing with these things is in a kind of a body of people as a body of believers um, in helping each other um, to um, live a righteous and a holy life. And this is what uh, Paul is doing. And Paul has been saying to the Corinthians in the passages that we've been reading in the sort of months up to now, you're boastful and you're proud and you think you're doing okay. So these Corinthians must have been sat there thinking, oh, this is a very long scroll. This is a long letter from Paul. I wonder if it's full of praise for us because we're doing great, aren't we? And sometimes it's possible to think that you're actually doing really well and you're doing great. And the person kind of brings you down a peg or two. I just think of one occasion when um, uh, I was a student many years ago and I was trying to decide what career to do. And I went to a presentation of, um, um, and it was some accountants and um, unlike probably most people, I wanted to be an accountant. And I, I went to this presentation and there was a chap who uh, was a very personable, very pleasant guy. And he was talking about his firm of accountants and what they did. And he was talking about careers with his firm. And I thought, oh, you're a likable chap. I'd love to work with you. You just seem so, so pleasant and so friendly. Um, so after this presentation, I filled out an application form and I put it in and I got invited for an inter interview. And this nice chap that I'd seen was, it was going to interview me. And I thought, oh, great, I'm going to be interviewed by this chap who I want to work for. And I went, to, went along to this interview. And believe me, that interview was one grilling. It's one of the hardest interviews I've ever been to. And I came away thinking I just completely miscalculated that. I wasn't expecting such a tough interview. And he asked me some really difficult questions and I was stuttering and stammering and I came away thinking, I haven't got a job there. And I was right, I never got that job. Um, so it's, it's very easy to think that we're doing well and to think that we're um, uh, pleasing and that give ourselves high marks and then somebody comes along and gives you a dose of reality. And it's not always what we want to hear. Um, so um, anyway, they're the kind of three main points that I want to make this morning. And it would be very easy for me to kind of put my books away, put everything in a bag, pack my bags, get in the car and drive back to Sunderland. They're my three points. But I can't do that because this is not an easy subject, is it? Um, sometimes you can say something and it raises far more questions than answers. We're to deal with sin in the church. How on earth do we do that? Put the next slide up, if you would, please. Um, yeah, Tom. I've just done a picture of a boat there. I don't know if you've heard this little phrase before. A lifeboat, to be effective, needs to be in the water, doesn't it? A boat that's not in the water isn't going to do anything. Um, and if you're going to rescue people from the water, you need to have a good boat that's in the water so you can lift people out of the water. But if the water gets in the lifeboat, we're in trouble, aren't we? So the church needs to be in the world. We need to have cafes and we need to go out in the world and do our job of work and we need to talk to our neighbours and we need to greet people in the street and talk to people in shops. We need to be in the world and rubbing shoulders with people, don't we, to be an effective church. But if the world gets in the church, then we're in real trouble. Um, let's go, go on to the next slide, which is just back to the summary that I had, um, had before. <coughs> and um, uh, so the, um, uh, the passage in, uh, in, in Corinthians does, does give us a few clues as to how, where to deal with sin. And um, uh, what, what I've done is I've, I've um, on the next slide, I've just put a list of questions that we might want to ask ourselves. So I've got nine questions here. Uh, and I think we need to sort of go through all of these questions because the, the main thing that I want to address this morning is this issue of how we deal 
with sin in the church. And there's quite a lot of talk in this passage about the difference between believers and unbelievers. And this is quite relevant because sometimes it's not always that easy to know whether somebody is even a real Christian or not. And there's quite an interesting little um, instruction in, uh, uh, that, that Paul gives to the Corinthians later on. It's right at the end of 2 Corinthians and it says this, um, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the, in the faith. Test yourselves. Do, do you not realize that Christ is in you? Unless of course you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that you have not failed the test. Um, so we, we've even got to test ourselves and ask ourselves, am I in the faith? Am I a real Christian? Am I a fake? Uh, have I really come to Christ? And it's quite important so that we can at least get some kind of idea as to whether somebody is in the faith or not. Um, one of the most simple, I suppose, um, clues as to whether somebody's in the faith. There are various tests that you can do, and I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list because uh, that's not my subject, but there are one or two clues that you see uh, in Paul's letters to the Corinthians to see whether somebody is a true believer or not. Um, and in the passage that we just read, it talks about associating with somebody who's sexually immoral or greedy or who's somebody who worships idols or somebody who slanders, or somebody's a drunkard, or somebody who's a swindler, uh, with such as person do not eat. And that's one of the clues is that we obviously, uh, we've hopefully turned from our sins and we do not habitually sin. Now, does that mean that um, we're perfect? We might not be perfect, but somebody who is constantly and habitually sinning and there's no sense of humility and no sense of repentance and no sense of wanting to put it right probably isn't in the faith um <clears throat> there's uh, um the, the, there's a verse quite an interesting little verse in chapter 12 of 1 corinthians and it says that i tell you that nobody who is speaking by the spirit of god says jesus be cursed and no one, no one says Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And it's actually quite hard for somebody who isn't in the Lord to say that Jesus is Lord and to speak about Jesus in a positive way. But it's actually quite easy for somebody who's not in the faith to maybe blaspheme and to swear and what have you. So maybe somebody's language and somebody's speaking. But the Bible's also very clear that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. So there has to be fruit coming through from our lives. There has to be uh, growing fruit. Um, so um, one of the signs that somebody is a true believer is a changed life. And we haven't read this passage, but um, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says, and this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So a true, a true believer and a true Christian is somebody who has had a change happen in their lives and they've come to realize that they're a sinner and that they need to be cleansed within by Jesus and they've come to trust in Jesus and their life has begun to change. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfect straight away because there's a journey of maturity and there might be still be quite a lot of immaturity going on but there's a journey that that person's on and we see day by day, week by week, year by year, that person growing in grace. So it's quite important sometimes to try and discern whether somebody is a true believer or not. So my next question is, well, how do we deal with sin in the church to begin with? And I've got to say that um, we do it gently, don't we? There are proverbs in the Bible about that. Um, one of my favorite proverbs is a harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle word turns away wrath. And 99% of the time, when we're dealing with a situation in the church, we do it in as gentle a way as possible. We do it with the minimum fuss and we do it in a really, really low key way. 
And I'm really grateful for people who've spoken into my life and done that. But another way of doing it is just to teach from the Bible, to do Bible studies and to speak in the way that I'm doing this morning. And often we don't even need to speak to somebody directly about something. If we come to church and we hear the word being read and we hear the word being proclaimed and we sing songs, sometimes some of those words will filter into our lives and will change us and help to change us inside and nobody even has to confront us directly against, uh, about something. <clears throat> so to begin with, we use a very, very gentle approach and we try and do it as gently as possible especially if that person might be a sensitive person and might be a wounded person. Well, what if that doesn't work? What if somebody persists in sin and the gentle approach doesn't work? Well, I'm not going to go this in, um, into this in detail because it's not really my subject, but we maybe kind of just raise the stakes a little bit and maybe go maybe bring a couple of people along and maybe sit down and have a more uh, heavy conversation about it and maybe kind of do a little mini Bible study and we maybe kind of raise the stakes a little bit. But what if we've raised the stakes a little bit and the person still persists in sin? What do we do then? Well, this is the situation that we've got in. Uh, in the passage that we're reading now. We actually have a situation in the church in Corinth where somebody is in, in a clearly immoral sexual relationship with somebody and it really does need dealing with in a serious way. Um, and this is a serious thing and um, this, is, this is quite a serious situation and this is why Paul is laying down this situation and mentioning it really early in his letter because it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be one of the first things that they look at. So even though the church, they've written him a letter and they've asked him lots of questions about various aspects of theology, Paul is getting in early and he's mentioning quite a heavy subject. So why is it so serious? Why is this subject so serious? Why can't we just kind of skirt around the subject? Why can't we just avoid the issue? Why can't we just be polite and not say anything and just allow the situation to continue? In, you know, and that often happens in a, a lot of our churches. Things are clearly wrong. Something's clearly going wrong in the church and nobody wants to talk about it. I don't know if you've ever uh, been in this, that kind of situation. Uh, well, I've, I've, I've got two reasons for that. Reason number one is if we allow sin to continue in our lives, and if it's a persistent sin, then I believe it's something that really hurts and breaks the heart of the Lord. There's a really, again, this is a really heavy passage and it doesn't get, um, doesn't really get preached about very often. Um, um, but... <coughs> But I, I, I think this kind of captures what is actually happening. I'm, I'm going to read a passage from uh, Hebrews chapter 10, starting from verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as unholy, an unholy thing, the blood of the covenant that sanctified him and who has insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So when Jesus has laid his life down and been sacrificed for our sin, and he's gone through all the pain of that for our sin, and we continue in sin, we're crucifying him all over again. We are putting the spear in his sides all over again. We're causing him that pain, and we are treating as dishonorable the thing that he's done. I've got this kind of picture in my mind. Um, 
I imagine a father gets a wonderful present for his son and a father kind of scrimps and saves and saves up for a really nice car and he gives a lovely car and a beautiful new spanking new car to his son and he puts a nice ribbon around it and uh, he says to his son I've got you a nice present for your 21st birthday and the son comes out and he says oh that's wonderful thanks dad for this lovely car and he gets in the car and he drives it around the block and he says, oh that's a wonderful gift and then the father goes away and the, and the son comes along and he gets a spray can out and he kind of sprays the car all sorts of garish colors and then he takes the car uh, out in the country and drives it around the fields and gets it really muddy and gets it really wet and horrible and the car breaks down and the car's ruined that's a little bit like the sort of thing that i'm talking about the lord gives us his salvation he gives us holiness he gives us righteousness he cleanses us of our sins and it, that is not a gift that we should abuse and that we should insult i've heard lots of people talk about uh, what it means to quench the holy spirit or what it means to grieve the holy spirit but in that passage that i've just read in, in hebrews it actually talks about insulting the Holy Spirit, insulting the Spirit of grace. So sin is a really, really important subject and it's quite a heavy subject, but it is something that we need to deal with in the church if it's persistent sin that somebody's not turning from and not repenting of. And the second reason why it's an important subject is because other people very easily get infected with sin. It's very, very contagious. And I know that we've had, um, I'm not even going to sort of talk about it. I know we've had illnesses and we've had a disease which has been infectious and we've had to be very careful that we don't pass on the disease. But sin is a really infectious disease and it's very easily passed on. Because what are we like as people? We are very social beings and we love to meet each other and we love to form family and we love to form groups and acceptance and belonging and being part of a group is a very very important thing for us um, and when we're when we're a church we go out of our way we want to make people feel accepted and we want, want to make somebody feel feel that they belong and we want to be a family to people and that's absolutely right that we are but sometimes that human instinct to want to belong can make us overlook a problem and a sin in the church. And if somebody comes into a church situation and they bring sin into that situation, sometimes it's easier to just want to be that person's friend and to want to um, get alongside that person and to want to feel accepted to them. Uh, accepted by them so actually confronting somebody and dealing with something like that can be a very very difficult thing to do so what um i'm probably doing the uh, the questions in the wrong uh, in in the in in the wrong order here but i want to just sort of jump to question eight because this is a really hard subject isn't it and there are certain qualities that we need to be able to have to deal with something and the, the 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 quality that i want to mention is um what the bible calls either jealousy or zeal being jealous and being zealous are the same thing in the bible it's the same word that's used for both being jealous and being zealous and if we're zealous for god's righteousness and for god's holiness and for his purity in our own lives and in the church that will give us the strength that we need to deal with a situation in the church. Um, I noticed that um, uh, Jonathan was making some bread this morning. Uh, was the yeast in the bread? Yeah, so there was normally when we're doing bread making, we put yeast in, don't we? And we only need a small amount of yeast to put in the bread, and it soon spreads through the whole dough, doesn't it? Um, and uh, uh, and you know in most forms of bread making you put a little bit of yeast in and you knead it and you sort of uh, and I saw the guys this morning and they were kind of um, just kneading the bread away and sort of working it to get the yeast through the whole batch of the bread and that's how that's how we make bread <coughs> um, 
but um, in the Bible, yeast is sometimes used um, as a kind of a metaphor for sin. And what, um, and what the Bible talks about is once sin gets into a small situation, just a little tiny little bit of sin uh, gets into a situation, it very quickly spreads through the whole batch. And it's something that we need to deal with as early as possible, because the earlier we deal with it, the less it becomes a problem. But if we don't deal with it, if we overlook it, it can spread through the whole fellowship. And I have seen this sort of thing happen uh, in a church situation that somebody gets into perhaps a, a situation that's immoral and nobody wants to deal with it. Nobody wants to talk about it because the person who's involved in that situation is a very popular person. They might be giving a lot of money to the church or they might have a great ministry in the church or they might just be a very, very popular person. So nobody wants to talk about it. And then over the months and over the years, that sort of behavior begins to affect everybody else in the church and the church becomes completely compromised. And, um, uh, and within a very short space of time, that church can be completely ruined. Jesus said that you are the salt of the world, but if salt loses its saltiness, it's useless. It's only useful to be thrown out and be trampled underfoot by men. And it's very easy for a church to become unsavory and for its saltiness and for its effectiveness to be removed and taken away. There's a church uh, near where we live. Um, it's just a couple, of hundred, a couple of hundred yards away from the front of our street. And um, uh, we, uh, Alison and I went along because they had a kind of a fire sale. They were, they were selling all the artifacts from the church because it had closed. And there were lots of Bibles and lots of hymn books and um, there were lots of kitchen utensils and lots of furniture that they were wanting to sell off. And we were curious. And um, uh, when I was having a look, I actually picked up a little booklet uh, that the church had produced. And the church had produced this about 20 years ago. And it was a history of this church. And it was just amazing what a thriving, lively church it was. Uh, and I, I later looked on the internet and I saw a picture of people in this church and the, it was filled to the rafters. And when I re read this booklet, I read of all the wonderful pastors and ministers that this church had had and how active it had been in preaching the gospel and bringing many, many people to faith and all the wonderful things that had happened in this church. And yet about 20 years ago, for some reason, and I don't know why, they compromised in some way. Something went wrong. Something, some yeast managed to work its way through the dough and the church, a big building, wonderful facility, the church was left with a tiny, tiny remnant of people left and the church ended up closing down and that can happen in any sort of situation. There are many churches near where I live where that kind of things happen and we don't want that to happen uh, among us either. So we, it's very important that we deal with things that will otherwise destroy the church because they'll make us completely ineffective. So this is a really important uh, subject. <clears throat> Wanted to um, just talk about um, something rather strange that Paul talks about at the beginning of this passage. In verse 4, he said, when you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus, and I'm with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature or the flesh may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Um, there's lots of debate about what it's meant by handing somebody over to Satan. And uh, I'm not here to say what that means. It may simply mean that they've got some kind of a membership system and we are expelling that person from membership from the church. Some people would very much argue that. There are other people who would say, no, there was actually quite more to it than that. Maybe there's some kind of form of um, words. Maybe there's some kind of, uh, uh, um, some kind of a uh, solemn uh, set of things that are said to hand that person over to Satan to deal with the sin. Um, 
but I, I did want to kind of maybe bring out there are one or two clues elsewhere in the Bible that maybe tell us something about what that's all about. So in um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, Paul actually said that there are a couple of people there who I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now that word for blaspheme, it might be blasphemy against the Lord, or it might simply be slander. The word is also used for slander. So maybe there are a couple of people in the church situation who are slanderers in some way or other. And Paul has actually said that he's handed them over to Satan, but he doesn't say anything more about that. And for sure, um, we could argue that the sort of world outside, it's Satan's realm, the whole world is in the grip of the evil one, and maybe it just means expelling somebody from the fellowship. But there's quite an intriguing little passage um, at the beginning of um, the book of Job in the Old Testament, and it uses exactly the same sort of phraseology that we're seeing in the New Testament. And I want to just turn to Job and just to read a couple of um, a couple of uh, passages out of the first and second uh, chapter of Job, which maybe give us a clue as to what this is all about. <clears throat> In Job chapter one, verse nine, it says this. This is this is a conversation going on between the Lord and Satan. Um, and this is, um, this is Satan speaking. Does, God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands and his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands. But on the man himself, do not lay a finger. And then a little bit further on in chapter 2, verse 4, it says, um, it says this, Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life, but stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to, to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. And you're seeing this process happening that, Job is being handed over to Satan for Satan to do something to him that's going to really, really harm Job and his, his protection, his hedge of protection is being removed from him. And something's happening here in, in 1 Corinthians where this man is being handed over to the kingdom of Satan and something of the divine protection that's around him that's in the church is being removed from him. Now something's maybe going to happen to him maybe something's going to happen to his health or maybe he's going to suffer some kind of misfortune but it's it's god's way of dealing with this person in a very very severe way because this might be the only thing that he will listen to and respond to and this is the really this is one of the really difficult things about this chapter because um I've been involved, and I don't want to go into any detail here because I just don't think it would be right to, but I have been involved in situations where I've seen a person who have gone off the rails and maybe got involved in some kind of compromise in their lives and seen them maybe suffer a serious illness or suffer some form of misfortune or mishap and thinking, I wonder if this is the kind of thing that we're talking about here that somebody is stubbornly refusing to sort themselves out and suddenly things have started going wrong in their lives. And maybe it's the only thing that they will respond to and listen to. And um, uh, there was quite a close friend of ours years ago who had a really serious illness and died quite young, but towards the end of their life, they were praising God and they were in God's presence. And I've got no doubt that this person who was really dear to was a really dear friend is in the presence of the Lord now, but it took a really, really serious illness to bring that person to their senses. Um, and this is the type of thing that we're perhaps talking about here, handing somebody over. That is a very, very solemn and tough thing to do, but it, we only do it 
if the gentle approach and the humble approach and the um, and that approach uh, hasn't worked. So right, where are we on our list of questions? I think we've answered that question. What happens to the person who's handed over? This can happen to, I've got to say, this, can, this doesn't necessarily happen to somebody who's into serious sin. Sometimes a person who's, in, um, who, who's living quite a, a good life and who's got a wonderful history and doing many things for the Lord, um, we're human beings, we are prone to get proud and God hates our pride. And when we, do, when we do a wonderful thing and somebody gives us a pat on the back and say, oh, that was great, you did a really good job there. Yes, in, in, in the right context, we say, yes, we, let's give the glory to God, but I'm really glad that the Lord's used us in some way. But if we allow pride to get into our lives, God will oppose that pride. And even the Apostle Paul, who did many wonderful things for the Lord and started many churches around the Roman world, he had a situation where um, he called it a messenger, from, a messenger from Satan. He had some kind of thorn in his flesh, and I don't know whether it was some physical ailment or whether it was something else, but he had something that afflicted him, and he had to plead with the Lord to take it away. And the Lord said, I'm not taking this away. This is a messenger from Satan, but I'm not going to take it away because you need this to keep you humble and to keep your feet on the ground. But my grace is sufficient for you because my, my power is made perfect in weakness. So it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's living a terrible life. The Lord might allow us in his grace and in his mercy and in his love to let us suffer and to allow something to happen in our lives that is either embarrassing or difficult or painful. And that is to keep our feet on the ground because in our humanity, we get really proud. And, um, you know, we might achieve something and we might not give the due honor to the Lord and we might think it's because of us and God's got to deal with us. So it's very common for Christian people who are used of the Lord to suffer in some uh, difficult way. <clears throat> I think I've probably been through a list of questions. I hope that um, uh, uh, I hope that we've learned something this morning. But um, uh, I did want to kind of just bring to the fore a few very practical situations that could happen around us and I am not going to give you any answers here. Um, I'm kind of going to raise, raise more questions because these most of these things are things that I've kind of come across in the Christian life. Um, there can be different situations that we can come across and we've got to ask ourselves do I just kind of stand back and not say anything or should I actually go and maybe say something and I'm not saying that, that I've, I've got the answer to this and I'm not saying that um, uh, I, I know what the right thing is to do but I'm going to give you a few scenarios just for you to think about and to go away and maybe you might even want to discuss them as a church in in a bible study I don't know but um, what if you met somebody and they were a wonderful Christian and um, they shared their faith and they served the Lord and they genuinely loved the Lord but they swear occasionally you hear expletives and you kind of think this doesn't seem quite right the person's swearing but I seem to know that they love the Lord and they worship the Lord and God uses them in many ways but, but they're swearing should I talk to them about it interesting one I'm not saying that I have the answer um maybe another one what if somebody comes along to the church, they love the Lord, they serve the Lord, but they've got a pet doctrine. And it might be something about what's going to happen in the last days, or it might be something about um, something that, discusses, that gets discussed in 1 Corinthians, but it's definitely a, a, it's a secondary doct doctrine. Maybe it's to do with, I don't know, um, the rapture or how you should dress at church or what sort of songs that you should have and they've, they've made it into a very very important foundational doctrine and what you believe about that almost makes you saved or not 
What if somebody's got their pet doctrine that they think is a really, really important thing? How do you deal with that? I'm sure we've seen that kind of thing happen. Um, what if somebody comes along to church and again, they love coming to church, they're a loving Christian person, they love the Lord, but they maybe dress a little bit inappropriately, maybe showing a little bit too much skin. And um, you kind of think, this isn't maybe helpful to some of the people in the church. How would you confront that person? What if that person's a young person and quite a sensitive person? What if, what if you impress, what if, there's a chance that you might approach that subject and you might really hurt them if you deal with it in the wrong way. Um, what if you're walking down the street and somebody comes out of the betting shop and it's your Christian friend who you've met at church and you kind of think, oh, gambling, gambling's wrong, isn't it? They've gone in the betting shop, should I say something? Should I pretend that I haven't seen them? Should I just say hello to them? Should I actually mention that to them? Should we have a conversation about it? I don't have the right and wrong answer. I'm just throwing all these things out. These are all situations that we might come across as Christians. And we've got to ask ourselves, what's the wise thing to do in this situation? And I'm, and I'm going to leave poor old Robin to maybe uh, uh, talk through some of these issues with you. Because these are all the sort of things that we can face as a church, aren't there? And some of them may be right, some of them may be wrong. And it might be right or it might be wrong to confront the situation, but we've got to be wise in the way that we confront them.